Спасибо. Ну вот теперь мы переходим к пленарным докладам. The first lecture will be delivered by our honored guest Stavos Zartakis. The name of his report, Taming Strong Ultra Short Laser and Terahertz Fields. You're welcome. Okay, go ahead. Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a real pleasure being here today. I'd like to thank the organizers for the great invitation. Um, so, what the, I will be talking to you about today is the way we can tame uh, strong laser and delicate spills. Uh, since I have to explain the word tame, uh, this is very simple. Tame is used for horses. If you want to control wild horses, you call this taming procedure. Okay, so we take this word from the horses, and now we are going to train not horses, we are going to train strong laser and target fields. Uh, I come from, uh, from Greece, from the University of Crete, and fourth is a big research institute in Greece. Actually, This is better. So um, I can use it like this. So we are located down here at the island of Crete. If you are up there. So we. Uh, this is our location. This is the foundation of research and technology. Actually, this is the biggest research center in, in Greece, and we belong to a network of laser centers around Europe that gives access to European scientists for doing research with uh, big laser installations. Uh, I will go briefly to a short introduction to what we are doing in our institute, since I'm also the deputy director of this institute. Uh, we have two research lines. One is the laser interactions with photonics, and the other is materials and devices. In the first one, we have a research on strong laser physics, where I also belong. Uh, interaction with atoms, molecules, and clusters, the strong laser fields. Theoretical approaches on this. And photon, photon science applications is everything that is uh, uh, photonic um, structuring, uh, photonic fibers, and uh, things like that. In the materials and devices uh, part of our institute, we have a microelectronics uh, uh, facility for building microelectronic structures. We have a very strong activity on soft matter, both theoretical and experimental. And actually, what uh, is soft matter is uh, all the polymers. Okay, it's polymer science. Uh, we have also magnetic materials research and low temperature uh, physics like Bose-Einstein condensation. A lot of theoretical also support in all these activities and a very big activity on metal materials, both theoretical and experimental. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples at the end of my talk about this. So let me show you the outline of my talk, which is the following. I will start with a short introduction about uh, what is nonlinear propagation, especially for students to understand what it, we are going to talk about? And then the main two parts of the talk is, going, is about taming or controlling filaments, laser filaments, uh, using exotic waves and photonic lattices. I'm going to explain all this stuff, so don't be afraid about it. And the second part of my talk is going to be about uh, how we can generate and control strong target fields 
that are generated from filaments as you're going to see how we control and optimize. Okay, so let me start from the very beginning uh, with some linear optics. You're all familiar, I believe you have some optics background, all of you, even the students here. So you all know that laser beams in the linear regime diffract and disperse in space and time. What does this mean? It means that simply in space, the beam will diffract as it propagates, it will become bigger. And also in time, a laser pulse will spread as well due to the dispersion of the medium, the chromatic dispersion of the medium. That means that the pulse as it propagates will become longer. So you're all familiar with this first slide. And then this is what happens in the linear regime, but what happens in the nonlinear? So in the nonlinear, when you start increasing the intensity of the laser beam, nonlinearity is coming into play. So the first nonlinearity that comes into play, uh, just at the critical power, is what is known the Kerr effect, which actually in the space is going to lead to a self-focusing of the beam. It will create a virtual lens that will self-focus the laser beam. And in the spatial domain, we can have a laser beam that is uh, restrained in space, so it creates a spatial soliton, as we call it. And the similar thing can happen in time, and this time it's called a temporal soliton. So just at the limit of the nonlinearity, we can have either a spatial or a temporal soliton, or if by chance we, if we manage to have both at the same time, the structures we generate, we call them light bullets, because they propagate in space and time without spreading, neither in space nor in time. Um, okay, so this is what happens. This actually, this mathematically you can describe it analytically, because these are steady state solutions. You can find the exact solution mathematically. Now, let's make things more complicated. Let's increase the input power. What will happen? If you start increasing the input power above the critical power, the Kerr effect can no longer be arrested by the normal diffraction. In the, in the previous case, we had a perfect balance between self-focusing and natural diffraction, linear diffraction. This is not the case anymore because the nonlinearities are stronger than the linear diffraction of the beam. So the beam will be focused further and the intensity will, get, will become higher. Higher intensities mean that we can reach electric fields that can ionize the medium. We can liberate free electrons. So if ionization kicks in, then locally we will have a plasma. And this plasma will act, will change the index of refraction of the medium, but this time in a way that it will spread the beam. It will open the beam. So the Kerr effect self-focusing the beam and the ionization defocuses the beam. So now you can understand that those two nonlinear effects will compete between them and create a dynamical structure that will Self, that will be self-guided and propagating in over long distances. And this structure, we call it actually in the literature, the last 15 years, uh, laser filamentation, laser filaments. Now, this is nothing but uh, steady state. This is a very dynamic thing. It happens, it is dynamic both in space. We have focusing and defocusing cycles. And also in time, we have very strong uh, temporal modulations. I will come back to this in, in a while. Uh, these are one of the few slides with, math with a lot of mathematics just to, to show you that we can really simulate exactly even this more complicated uh, propagation. So you have the nonlinear propagation, uh, Schrodinger equation, uh, you have diffraction, you have dispersion, and all the nonlinear terms included in this last part where you can have the curve uh, nonlinearities, the plasma nonlinearities, multiphoton absorption, uh, and losses and all this stuff. And then we need also to couple this equation with um, an electron rate equation because you will generate in time electrons and these electrons will absorb uh, further ra laser radiation and will also recombine in time. So you have to solve the, this um, set of equations uh, simultaneously in space and time. And of course this can be done only numerically. So this is uh, what uh, uh, we are doing. Uh, to simulate this kind of experiment. Um, just to tell you now a few things why this filamentation, this nonlinear propagation is of interest. Because of the applications, it's a very nice uh, physical phenomenon anyway, uh, 
but there are a lot of applications um, of implementation, including pulse shortening. And actually, in many labs around the world nowadays, they use this laser implementation to shorten the original laser pulse, and then use this to generate higher harmonics and consequently other second pulses. Uh, there are applications in chemistry or LIDAR because the spectrum of the laser pulse now is not limited as it used to be from the laser source itself. Now it has a, a super continuum spectrum. It goes from the ultraviolet up to the mid-infrared. It's a real white light laser and it's still femtosecond laser. So you can use this femtosecond broadband spectrum uh, laser to do LIDAR or chemistry. Uh, you can use also the plasma that you have along this long channel, and I didn't mention it, but uh, these long channels can be hundreds of meters long in atmosphere, even kilometers, and in solids it can be many tens of centimeters long, with intensities in it in the order of 10 to the 13 watts per square centimeter, which really ionizes the medium. Uh, and you can use this uh, connect these ionized channels to trigger and guide electric discharges and eventually light. You can use it for a number of nonlinear processes. The most interesting one is we can use it to generate terahertz radiation, as I will discuss to you in the second part of this talk. Uh, of course, you can remotely deposit very high intensities. This is interesting because you can have your laser source here and you can deposit at the very high intensities at very low distances without being affected by turbulence in the atmosphere or things like that. So this has interesting applications, both uh, civil and military. So just introduce why this taming in the type. The taming is explained here because this process is highly nonlinear and it's strongly dynamical. What does this mean? This means that in space, we have focusing, defocusing, refocusing cycles. It's not a steady state solution, it's dynamic. And in time, this is the original Gaussian pulse, you see that as it propagates, if you have pulse splitting. Your original pulse, your nice pulse, has split in many sub-pulses, which might not be very interesting for applications. This is not good for other second science, for instance. So what we want to do is we want to control this highly nonlinear process. And this is not a trivial task, and I'm going to show you two ways, uh, two directions uh, that we can do. But before going there, I'd like to sh really show you a filament how it looks like, because up to now it was sketches and, and uh, 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 words. So let me show you how it looks like. Now I'm going to use uh, an inline holographic technique to follow the laser beam as it propagates in the medium. The medium can be air, can be transparent glasses, or liquids, okay, any kind of transparent media. So I have my laser beam that creates the filamentation here, and I have another uh, appropriately time delayed pulse that comes and senses what has happened here in the medium, and then I'm using, I'm recording inline holograms uh, like this, and using an iterative algorithm, I can reconstruct both amplitude and phase of my probing affected by the pump. And doing that, I can fully reconstruct the propagation of the laser beam. This is different snapshots at different times. This is a very, very short pulse. This is a femtosecond pulse. So you see that one picosecond after, the pulse has long been gone, but still there is something in the medium. Actually, this green color that you see here is, are the electrons that are left behind, because, of course, electrons have a lifetime. So the pulse lives, but the electrons remain. Okay, so this is the, the plasma channel that you can use for applications involving the plasma. And also, something else you can remark here are these spots. These spots are nothing else but these refocusing cycles I was mentioning before. You have focusing, refocusing, refocusing cycles. You can really see it experimentally. And this was the plasma. And what about this magenta color over here? If you can see it from behind, the magenta color corresponds to a positive index of refraction change, which is actually the care effect. Actually, you can see already the care effect itself, which is just a notion in when you read a book. You can really see it in reality. Okay. So this is how a filament looks like, and you can really follow it. 
and you can do more using this technique. You can follow, this is in, um, in solids, you can follow the evolution of the plasma to uh, the generation of excitons and the decay of excitons, uh, the generation of defects in the medium, and how finally in the glass you are going to change the index of refraction permanently, the index of refraction in the medium, and create photonic waveguides or photonic devices inside the bulk of glasses. This is how you do it. So, I go to the main part now of the control. Taming filamentation using exotic waves. And now I think you can understand why I use exotic waves, because our waves are going to look something like that. Really exotic, nothing usual. Okay. So our, ex our exotic waves are, in reality, non-diffracting beams. We are going to take non-diffracting beams. Most of you should be familiar uh, with the first family here, the vessel beams, okay, which looks like this, a central spot surrounded by, by, by concentric rings. But you have also other members in the family of non-diffracting beams, like the A beams that looks like this in space. They occupy only one quarter of the space, or parabolic beams, or Matthew beams, or whatever you like. In this presentation, I will focus in these A beams, uh, and what we are going to do, we are going to use these linear non-diffracting beams and apply non-linearities on it and see how this works, what, what effects does it have. So, first of all, the A beams have been introduced um, in, in science in the mid-70s as a solution to the normalized proaxial propagation equation. And actually, it's the only non-dispersive solution in one dimension of this equation uh, in uh, quantum mechanics. Actually. Now, uh, if you take the square of this uh, area function, it looks like this ringing uh, uh, plot. And if you plot it in two dimensions, a beam, an A beam would look like this. It has a central spot and then secondary spots in one quarter of the space. Now, what is really interesting and exciting about this kind of, of, of beams is that they are accelerated. What does accelerating mean? In space, it means this is the propagation distance, this is the central lobe, these are the secondary lobes. A normal beam like the one I'm ha having on my hand, a Gaussian beam, always goes straight. An A beam, as it propagates, turns. Actually, an A beam can go around the corner without the use of any specific optics, just by the original phase it had. This is a purely linear effect. So, how do you generate air beams? To generate, for instance, vessels, it's very trivial. You take a conical lens. This is not so trivial to do for generating air beams. To generate air beams, let's start with a truncated air, uh, the air function truncated, because you need to have a truncation in space. It's not infinite. If you take the Fourier transform of this air uh, beam, you see that it's actually a Gaussian with a spatial cubic term. So what does this mean? If I take my laser beam that comes out of my laser, and by any kind of means I imprint a cubic phase on its wavefront, and I back fully transform it, I will get an AB. This looks complicated. It isn't, because simply this is the way you do it. You start with your laser beam, you introduce a phase mask that has the cubic phase, and then the Fourier transform is done by a simple lens. And at the Fourier plane, the focal spot, the, at the focal shape, in reality, you generate your AD beam. So it's not that difficult. It's quite expensive, though, because these lenses, these, uh, f these phases, phase masks, uh, have a kind of co are quite costly. Uh, another way to generate, to imprint, so you can use either a face mask that you buy on purpose and it has a specific attribute. So it's, it has use for a specific application. Or you can use. Uh, SLMs, partial light modulators, you know, these screens that you can locally imprint the phase at different points of the beam. Again, you will imprint your cubic phase and get your A beam. All this is very expensive, so that's why we thought about finding a more uh, cheap way for doing this and a clever one. And actually, we will use uh, aberrations, optical aberrations that nobody likes. We like them a lot. Because if you look in the aberration formula that you're going, and you look on the cubic, on the comma aberration, you're going to see that it has a cubic term, cubic phase. 
So if we can suppress everything else and keep only the cubic phase, then there we go. We can get our AB. This, unfortunately, cannot be done in two dimensions in once, in sp with spherical optics. You cannot isolate the comabration, but you can do it with cylindrical optics. So we are going to take cylindrical optics in one dimension thus, take a telescope, diverging and converging lens. If they are perfectly aligned, the phase is flat. If you misalign them appropriately, you gain the cubic phase in one dimension. But you need two to, gain, to generate the beam. So what we are going to do is we're going to take a second telescope, which we're going to turn the other way around, in the other direction. So the first one is going to give us the x, and the second one the y. And there you go, you have the 2D cubic phase. And this really works very nicely, and I'm going to show you now an extra way to introduce also airy in time. So we have our, our airy in space, how we can have an airy pulse now. In the same way, you need to increase the cubic phase, but this time not on the wavelength, but on the spectrum. So we will start with our Gaussian Gaussian uh, wave packet that comes out of our laser. Okay, you recognize this ball is a Gaussian Gaussian distribution. You're going to use uh, a compressed a stretcher actually, and with a cylindrical lens, and appropriately tilting this, we'll introduce a cubic phase on the spectrum. At the exit of our stretcher, we're going to have a Gaussian and an airy pulse. And then we're going to send this in our cubic uh, wavefront uh, uh, modulator, and at the exit, we're going to end up with an airy cube. Airy in all dimensions, space and time. And now we're going to try to see how this propagates in the linear regime and in the nonlinear regime. So this is how it looks like. These are experiments, the real experiments. This is space, you recognize the airy beam profile along different propagation distances. And this is the airy profile of the pulse. Again, at different <coughs> propagation distances. And this is not a small sample. This is a PMMA sample, a plastic sample, 1.5 meters long. It's a huge sample. And if you take numbers down, you're going to see that at this distance corresponds to more than eight times the Rayleigh length in space, and more than five times the dispersion length. And you see that really, neither in time nor in space, your beam shape changes. So this is nothing else but the definition of a light bullet. This is an airy cube light bullet. And actually, this is the reconstruction using this data. This is an experimental reconstruction. This is how it really looks. So this is a very nice light bullet. This is already something quite exciting to create a light bullet. Uh, but we want to see this in the nonlinear regime. So in the nonlinear regime, what does it mean? We're going to put more energy in the system. We're going to increase the nonlinearities. So these three images do that. You, s you are at low energies, higher energies, higher energies. And what you can see, I hope you can see it in the back, you get having small scale filamentation inside all these lobes. You see? Can you see? You actually start to destroy your beam profile by getting multiple filamentation. And in time, you get a similar thing. The black curve was the original one. And as you increase the power, you completely destroy your air pulse. So somebody would say, OK, this is the end of the A uh, bullet. This is not exactly true, because now, if you reduce the nonlinearities, you go out of your sample, for instance, in, in air, and you let your beam propagate, it has a cubic phase information. And what does this will do? It will self-heal the airy light bullet, like this. So this is the original uh, beam at the exit. We let it propagate. It fully reconstructs in space and fully reconstructs in time. So this is the self-healing air cube light bulb. This is exciting for applications where you want to go through media that are turbulent or they have diffraction or scattering. Okay. So this is this was the first example I wanted to discuss with you today uh, with exotic waves. The second example I would like to discuss with you today is again with air beams, but this time ring air beams. What are ring air beams? Imagine your air beam in cylindrical symmetry. 
So in cylindrical symmetry, it will look like concentric rings like this. Now, as I told you already, air beams accelerate. So if you had a simple air beam that would accelerate towards the diagonal, if you have an, a ring air, this, the ring will collapse. So the beam itself will autofocus by itself without any lens. Experiment the air ring and how it collapses by itself, giving the first ring the first spot, the second ring the second spot, etc., etc. Now, why this is interesting? Of course, it's beautiful by itself because it autofocuses without any lens. But what is really interesting is that if you compare how the energy is distributed in the ring A ring here compared to Gaussian beams, you have a great advantage to Gaussians because Gaussians, the intensity increases as we approach the sample. That means that if you want to locally change only here, you cannot do it with Gaussians because you have energy here. So in nanosurgery, you will destroy the material before the focus. With these ring A beams, there is nothing over here. So the intensity will increase very sharply, only at the focus. So this is an excellent candidate for nano lithography or nano surgery. Uh, for instance, you can use this to ablate the exit surface of a piece of glass without destroying the inside material. Not, not, there is no other beam that can do that. And of course, you can reduce also some more exotic things like air in time or counter propagating air contrast. I don't want to tie you with more of this stuff. I would like simply to close this part uh, by discussing briefly what happens in the nonlinear vision. So when we increase the power. Something very interesting happens. First of all, since there is no energy here, as we increase the power, there is no focus shift. Those who, who have experience with nonlinear optics know that when you increase the power, there is a nonlinear focus shift. The, sh the focus comes closer to the socket because of the curve. This is not the case here. This is not the case here as is shown here. This is how a Gaussian beam would uh, uh, behave as we increase the power. This is the ratio of the input power compared to the critical power. And you see the focus position. In, that ca in this case, we started from 24 in the linear regime and could drop down to 11 centimeters, 13 centimeters closer in the nonlinear regime, while in the ring area, you see that there is practically no change except a very s small one here that we can actually calculate with precision. And it is due to the cross care term on the first ring. But I don't want to go into the details. So what happens in the nonlinear regime? There is no focus shift, but something very exciting happens. So this is this black line is the ring area profile along the propagation intensity distance, and you see the first peak, the second peak, the third peak, etc., etc. And now, as you start increasing the power, what happens is this: there is an increase of all the secondary loads and an interconnection between them. So you start from a very well localized focus, and you end up with a very nice filament with a very precise starting position. So at very high input powers. Airy, ring air beams lead to filaments. Very interesting structures. And this is a filament, but is it more than a filament? Let's have a look. This is space. Huh? You see the nice filament. What happens in time? Let's see the time. This is the, gush, this is the ring air beam in time, cross-section in time, space-time. And you see that there is practically no evolution. Look at the center. There is practically no evolution in time. In space, we have already no evolution. Now we have it also in time. And compare it to the Gaussian. Look what happens to Gaussian. Huge evolution of time. Pulse breakup, secondary lobes, everything you like. In the ring air, this is constant, almost constant. So we have, again, uh, space stability and time stability. What is this? Light bullet. So again, we have a nonlinear light pool. This concludes the first approach we use to create, uh, to control filamentation. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about the second one, which is uh, using photonic lattices. What is a photonic lattice? A photonic lattice is a periodic modulation of the index of refraction of the medium. So imagine that you have um, 
an array of waveguides in, in, in a piece of glass, for instance. This is a photonic lattice, okay? So we are interested to see how the nonlinear propagation behaves in a medium that has no uh, um, structuring and structuring with a periodic, in a periodic way, in a photonic lattice. And see what happens. I will start uh, uh, the simulation. This is, I will go fast with this. This is, we are going to work in cylindrical symmetry. And I want you to show you directly numerical simulations about this. This is space. This is the propagation distance. This is intensity. This is the Gaussian beam. And how it propagates in the linear regime without the lattice. What it happens, it diffracts. Nothing else. A beam that diffracts. Great. What will happen to the same beam in the linear regime if you launch it in this periodic medium, in the lattice? Well, it will diffract further because the lattice is nothing else but a diffractive element. It's a gradient. It will diffract further the energy. So let's see now what the, the same situation, the same two cases in the nonlinear. So first of all, without the lattice, what we get is a sharp filament, but which is short and not, uh, uh, and has a huge variation in intensity. So this is a classical filament in a homogeneous medium. We take the same input conditions and we launch it in the lattice, and this is what we get, a nice filament which is uniform and really, uh, really nice. Uh, actually, we can control how the filament looks like by changing the index of the fraction. We can really control the propagation, and the same we can do it by changing the period of the lattice. I'm going a bit fast here because I don't have much time, and I just want you to give you the main ideas. So actually, using the lattice, you can really control how the filament will look like, changing the index of refraction or the period of your lattice. And now let's see what happens against simulations. When you launch a Gaussian-Gaussian wave packet, you recognize this bullet now. In, without the lattice, what happens is that we have a shrinking in both space and time. Then pulse break up. And then after losses, you, what you, you, your final state is again diffraction because you have so much losses that we are back to linear, to linear diffraction. The same wave packet, same input parameters in the lines. <coughs> this is what happens. <coughs> it shell shrinks, but then remains constant. So this is an intense light bullet. And now you understand why people call it bullet, because it really looks like a bullet, a gun bullet. OK, it's, it's really, uh, you can visualize it now and know why they call it like that. And actually, these light bullets are quite resistant in, uh, in uh, the nonlinear regime because if you introduce noise in your, in your original wave packet, you see that the filamentation, the classical filamentation process, changes considerably while the bullet doesn't. So this is quite robust. Experiments to verify that this works. We take a piece of glass and we write a photonic lattice. How we do it? We take a femtosecond laser beam. We focus it inside the bulb, and we write waveguides, okay. an array of waveguides. This is the experiment. This is the simulation. This is the simulation showing the filament, the short filament experiment. In the lattice simulation and experiment, you see a broadening of the filament. And actually, if you change the delta n or the period, you should have some control. And this is exactly what is shown here and resumed in this curve. We have a very nice control in the filamentation process, both experimentally now. This is the experimental proof that you can control the filamentation process uh, using this lattice. So this was a permanent lattice written in a piece of glass. But of course, this applies only to glasses, to, yeah, to glasses, solid state. Can you do something similar in gases or liquids? You cannot write something permanent in gases or liquids. But you can write something which is transient, dynamic. You can write a plasma lattice. So this is exactly what we have done in this experiment. We take now a water tank and we interfere two vessel beams. The vessel beams will create this kind of pattern. This is an intensity pattern, this is experiment, this is theory. And of course where you have big intensities you will have also plasma. So during the lifetime of plasma we modify the index of refraction of the medium and we launch the beam in the center here as is shown here launch our beam and we observe what happens. Experiment again. So this is what happens experimentally without the lattice and this is with the lattice. I think you can see it visually by yourself that we have an extension and a more uniform structure. So it works both with uh, 
permanent and transient letters. Great. And now I'm coming to the second and last part of my talk, which is about strong therapy scores. I know that there is a very big activity in the institute here with therapy beams, uh, and I don't need to explain much about what is terahertz, of course, it's found between millimeter waves and defined for N. Uh, a milli electron volt photon energies, that means non destructive, which is ideal for medical applications. Uh, and of course, it's very interesting because of the numerous applications you can find for terahertz, including security screening. Already, there are security, terahertz security screeners in uh, international airports. They go to an airport and they ask you to put your hands on this. You go through a terahertz scanner. Uh, you can do medical imaging, or you can detect a number of um, non-wanted structures like uh, drugs or explosives. And this inside the packing, the package, because terahertz radiation can go through packaging, through plastic, through clothes, through uh, uh, many, many materials. Okay. So this is just. Most of you are familiar with this, so I don't want to spend more time. What we are interested in is to increase now the power of the therapy beams. Because we would like to do some nonlinear stuff using stronger therapy beams, not only spectroscopy and imaging. So there are two classical approaches for this. Already one, this one exists in the market. Uh, this is based on the photoconductive antennas. I'm not explaining what is a photoconductive antenna. I'm going simply to tell you that the conductive antenna uh, is a circuit that you short circuit with a very fast laser beam. Uh, and instead of having only one, what these people did, they multiplied the number of conductive antennas. So equally, if they are in phase, you will multiply the output of power of your source. So this is one straightforward way of increasing the variance power. Of course, it has its limitations. The second way of increasing the power and using nonlinear optics here is using nonlinear crystals. And the big limitation here is that you need to use uh, the appropriate phase match conditions and to find uh, nonlinear materials that have big electroptic coefficients. So uh, there's big activity using lithium niobate crystals, but for the phase matching between the 800 and the terahertz, the pulse font has to be tilted like this. If you did them like this, then you have phase matching and you get efficient conversion of your 800 to the terahertz. Beam. There are many groups around the world that use this technique and can actually generate high, very high terahertz uh, fields. Drawbacks. This is roughly monochromatic. You cannot tune it. It has a specific frequency and that's it. I'm going to show you a way where we can really tune the source. How? by using filamentation, that we really know very well dealing with it, and we can really control it. So now we're going to use the filamentation tailoring uh, I discussed previously, and apply it to control the terahertz source itself. So how we do it? We focus in a simple gas, in simple air. The medium is no longer for the conductive antennas or nonlinear crystals, it's simple air, or different gases. And instead of having only the fundamental of the laser, we couple it with the second harmonic in a specific way that I will explain in a minute. What happens here is that we have plasma. So if you have plasma, you have already the, the, the ingredients to generate uh, diapers. Because you need diapers that will oscillate at the plasma frequency and emit the radiation. Otherwise, there is no emission. So one way of generating the diapers, separating the electrons from the ions, is by simply applying an external DC field. So you go close to the plasma and you apply an external DC field. There you go. You have separated the electrons from the ions. You have your dipoles which oscillate the plasma frequency and this emits the radiation. It does work quite well. The problem is that the external voltage you can apply here is limited due to the breakdown of the material, of the gas. So this is 10 to the 3 volts per centimeter, roughly. And before that, you have some screening effects uh, that not even reach that. So the, the energy you can get out of this is limited. But why use an external DC field and don't use the laser field itself to do this work? 
Well, if you have only one color, you cannot do this because this is symmetric. So the electrons will go up and down, up and down, up and down, and the average current will be zero because the electrons will come back to their original position. So you don't have any dipoles. So you need to, check, to break the symmetry. And that's what we are doing by mixing the fundamental with the second harmonic in a way that you break the symmetry of the electric field. Since the electric field is no longer symmetric, the electrons will not come back to the original place. They will be separated by their ions. So you will generate your dipoles like that. And here you have 10 to the 9 volts per centimeter or even bigger. So you have big number. Here you have 10 to the 3. Here you can have 10 to the 9. So the intensity you can get out of here of the terahertz is considerably high. And actually, it's one of the strongest terahertz sources available today with outputs comparable only um, uh, to free electron lasers and sinking radiation. Further advantages, they are broadband. You can have bandwidths which are above 10 terahertz, which is quite unique. And last but not least is the tunability, because through filamentation tailoring that I discussed previously, you can tune the energy, the bandwidth, or the polarization of the source, as we very briefly explained in a minute. So, three examples. Terahertz radiation tailoring, first example. How we can scale the energy. The key issue here is to increase the filament length, keeping at the same time very high electron density. I don't have the time to explain why, why this is needed, but for those interested, we can discuss it afterwards. So one way to do it, so this is not easy to do, simply putting more energy. It will not give you a longer filament. It will give you multiple filaments. It will break your pulse. This is not what you need. You need a robust filament, which is longer. So the way to do it is generating uh, a chain of filaments. And if you appropriately align them, this will lead to concatenated filaments, linked filaments in a series. So if you take only two, and you combine it like this, you would say that you would double the output terahertz power. Actually, you have a tenfold increase of your power, 10 times more. So this is a very efficient way of increasing your power. How we can tailor the pulse duration and the spectrum? Simply tailoring this, the plasma distribution, how it looks like. How you can do that? Again, using aberrations. We love aberrations. Uh, so by using aberrations, you can create plasma channels that are very different. This is the, the fluorescence of the plasma, as you see it in air. You see that you have asymmetric or symmetric distributions, gradients, uniform structures, etc. Each one of those, and these are only a few examples, will give you a different electric field. This is the terahertz electric field, and you see that each one of those four give you already a different electric field. So you can tune the pulse shape, and you can tune the pulse spectrum because if you fully transform this, this is going to give you different spectrum at each time. Last example. Can you control the polarization of the source? Yes, you can. Because you simply need to control the um, phase between the fundamental and the second harmonic. So, if and how you can do that in an easy way? Simply putting a gas cell here and changing the pressure. Since the medium is dispersive, uh, it will have a different index of refraction for the fundamental and the second harmonic at each different pressure. So simply changing the pressure of your gas, you change the phase between the fundamental and the second harmonic. And let's look what this does. This is the output intensity of the terahertz as we change the pressure. In this case was nitrogen. And you see that the intensity is roughly constant. But take a closer look in the polarization of the source. At this point, it was linear this axis, linear on this axis, linear on this axis, linear on this axis. What have we done? A perfect half-wave plate, broadband half-wave plate. All of you that work in the terahertz field know that there are no good optical elements for terahertz. So if you can tailor the source itself to do it, it has tremendous advantages. So this is what we are doing. We are tailoring the source itself to produce a different polarization state. And we can do it only Halfway plate? No. We can do a halfway plate or a quarter wave plate. We can go from linear to fully circular, changing slightly the conditions. Two more examples of controlling, and I will close with this. Not tailoring now the filamentation, but using 
advanced materials. First, advanced material, metamaterials. You also have an activity in metamaterials here. I will go very briefly again. Metamaterials, you have structures, metallic structures like this that have specific gaps. In this case, we have a dielectric substrate and three gaps on the system. And we're going to deposit locally only on the two of the three gaps a semiconductor, silicon. This is a real photo of the system, how it looks like, the experiment. Only over here you have a semiconductor. So what is going to happen? If you take a laser beam now and we shine, you photoexcite the sun to the substrate, nothing will happen, it's a dielectric. The metals, you don't care. Only the semiconductor will be, become a conductor. So actually you will short circuit these gaps. And the system will operate at a different frequency. So this is an ultra fast directed switch. It works without photoexcitation here, with photoexcitation here. A sub femtosecond directed switch for 10 millimeters. And the last example with advanced materials, I'm going to use eutheric materials. Eutherics come from a mixture of two different materials that have a common um, point that they resolidify. It's called the eutheric point, and they resolidify at different phases, at their own phases. They don't mix, actually. So when you do that, one part will become the matrix, and the other part will do rods in this specific case. So this is a, a cut of the sample. One material gives these rods. The other material will give you the matrix. So actually, what have you done? Like this. Self-organized lattices. Okay. So we're going to take these lattices here, and I'm going to look for a specific case where I have two different materials, potassium chloride uh, and lithium fluoride, and if I look at six teracons, the potassium chloride has epsilon near zero. That means that light does not propagate in this medium. This is the matrix. So if I send six teracons beam in this medium, it will not propagate. And why, find, and why we do have a transmission here at six tickets? This is because we get mere resonance on the rods. We told you that the material the lithium fluoride creates rods, and you have this mere resonance on this rod. And actually, if you bring close enough the second rod, this mere resonance will couple the second rod and will be guided. So not only it will be guided, but it will be guided uh, even at sub wavelength sizes. Example, six terahertz radiation, the wavelength is 50 nanometers. I have an opening here of 50 nanometers, one lambda, one wavelength. I let it propagate in potassium chloride, it doesn't, epsilon near zero. I let it propagate in pure lithium chloride. It does propagate, of course, but it strongly diffracts. If I let it propagate in the euthetic, you see a very nice guided mode due to the mirror. Resonance. This is one wavelength. Can I do it sub-wavelength? 15 microns, the same thing, but this time one quarter of the wavelength. Doesn't propagate, strongly diffracts, nicely guided. Sub-wavelength guiding of the third. I think I don't have much time left, so I will conclude only with one experiment showing you the interest of using high-intensity uh, therapeutic fields. I promised that I said, I told you, that you can do nonlinear optics and excitation studies. This is an example. I'm going to take my strong tariff beam and launch it to a semiconductor. The semiconductor structure, the sketch looks like this. You have your atoms, uh, and inside the atoms you have electrons, and the atoms are, you can say they are connected, you have vibrations, you have the photons in the lattice. When you excite a semiconductor with a near infrared laser beam, what you excite are the electrons, of course. And then what you have take a transmissivity measurement in your sample, everybody knows, those experimentalists very well know, that you quickly create the carriers and then you have a very long relaxation time, which is what? Which is simply the electron photon scattering in your medium. Okay, that means electrons will give their energy to the lattice, but incoherently they will excite the whole system, all the vibration modes, everything, incoherently, if you like, almost thermally. But this pho these phonons in the system are mainly in the telecast regime. 
So if I come selectively and I send a specific wavelength that fits a phonon frequency in this system, and I send a strong field, can I excite it only and only that one? The answer is yes. So now I'm sending the terahertz field, and I extract and, and I excite a two terahertz phonon coherently as is shown here in the system. And please notice that this is done at room temperature. That means that I'm going to go above the thermal button, above the thermal noise of the system. And with this, I would like to acknowledge, of course, this is not a personal work. This is a work of a very big group and collaborators, people from my group. Some of you may recognize one name here because Andrei Gorodetsky was a member of your institute a few years ago. He was with me for two years, and now he's going to, to England. And uh, a number of external collaborators, Arnaud Cuéron from France, for all the simulation part of the uh, nonlinear propagation. Daniele Faccio that we did a lot of things with exotic waves, Costa Sukulis for the metamaterials, and Dimitri Christopoulidis from Creon, in Florida, uh, again for the AI beams, a number of uh, funding uh, available to these projects from both from the European Union and Greece. More information you can find in my group's website. And those interested in the filamentation uh, community, they can look in the filamentation.org website where uh, all the groups working in the field appear, but most importantly, all the publications since day number one up to now. Thank you very much for your attention.